My name's Ivor Livingston. I'm uh, the CEO of Message Manager Solutions. Um, I see I've got the video on there. You can see that my, my hair is still a very dark colour. Um, and I still look as fine as I did uh, 10 years ago when that photo was taken. Um, I'm one of the founders of Message Manager Solutions and um, essentially I'm the CEO, uh, though all these people like Peter Bloden who's with me today um, know a lot more about the technicals of uh, IP. Um, let's say good morning to Peter. How are you? Uh, good, thank you. Uh, Peter's our tech support manager. Um, we um, owe an awful lot to, of the success of our um, in, in the IP networks to Peter, and I asked him along today because there may be some um, serious questions that I can't answer, and um, he probably can give a better explanation of some of the issues we're, uh, we're going to go through. What we're going to talk about is, uh, is facts, obviously, and um, how established it is in the world of business and telephony, why it doesn't work on IP networks. Uh, we're going to talk about the two types of facts that we run on IP networks, T38, uh, which is the default, essentially, and um, G711 pass-through. And then we'll talk about Message Manager IP fax server software, how it works in the virtual environment, how reliable it is in the virtual environment, um, the applications it interoperates with, uh, sorry, the IP telephony it interoperates with, um, integration with the applications, and the benefits of uh, running um, your fax server uh, on an IT network. For those of you who don't know very much about Mrs. Manager Solutions, we've been around for a long time. We're, uh, uh, most people say uh, you're a pioneer. You're great to still be in business. Um, we started the business, we started life in 1982 uh, in messaging and communications. Um, Essentially, in those days, the dominant messaging communications network was um, Telex, and we very quickly uh, developed some solutions that connected uh, the computing environments of the day to the Telex network. We moved into fax because fax took over rapidly in 1986, uh, 85, 86. Those communication responsibilities that had been um, provided by the Telex network. And Australia very rapidly became a, um, a popular user of fax in the Western world. Um, for those of you who may be interested, um, the Japanese obviously were the leaders in computer based, uh, were the leaders in fax, uh, the most prolific users of fax in the world, with something like 16, 17 machines per 100 workers. But we were second, tied with Hong Kong, with eight. And the reasons are obvious. We didn't have email. Telex was expensive, slow and cumbersome. It was a lot easier to send a fax to those other people in the world, particularly overseas that we were, um, we were dealing with. We invented the fax server. Um, we developed a fax solution to connect minis and mainframes, pretty much modeled on our Telex solution. And that very quickly grew to become the solution that we're talking about today, uh, Mrs. Manager IP Fax. Uh, along the way, uh, we've installed very many successful solutions for many high-profile customers, both in Australia uh, and overseas. Uh, in more recent times, um, most of this business has been IP Fax business. Um, you'll see a logo there. Uh, we're the number one Fax ISV in Asia Pack. Uh, Peter Davidson uh, does seminars and has been writing on fax and fax servers uh, ever since I've been in the business. Uh, he called us some years ago, Crocodile Fax Down Under, which attracted a lot of um, publicity in the US and led to us uh, licensing our software to a number of overseas vendors. Message Manager Solutions doesn't just develop uh, fax solutions. Uh, thankfully, we don't do telex anymore, um, but SMS, voice, speech, uh, etc. Uh, other solutions, particularly again IP, uh, that we specialise in. Fax is a very old technology. It was introduced some 160 years ago by a Scot called Alexander Bain. He was like a lot of developers a little bit before his time. Uh, when he developed Fax, um, the telephone network wasn't around. Uh, 
Um, and it wasn't any surprise that he died destitute um, uh, in uh, in Scotland. In 1980, Group 3 fax became very popular, largely because of the development of the microprocessor, the uh, techniques they used in Japan to manufacture cameras, and probably the attitude of the Japanese engineers who decided it would be better to collaborate on a standard which we know as Group 3 today, essentially T.30. Um, and share the spoils. In 1986, uh, Message Manager Solutions developed the world's first fax server. Uh, this happened because of a number of requests from major banks such as ANZ, uh, such as uh, Avis Carr, who are still customers today, the rental organization. The cost of, they were sending so many faxes that the cost of printing the fax out, taking it to the fax machine, um, sending it, waiting for uh, an OK, uh, going to the fax machine looking for incoming faxes, uh, the lack of confidentiality. All these reasons made um, the business case uh, obvious for a, uh, a fax server. And we have been active uh, in that market uh, ever since 1986. I made the statement here, if you think fax will soon go away, don't hold your breath. Um, it is still an essential technology for business today. I think the fax machine has certainly gone away, but fax technology is established. It's still being used for daily, often critical communication requirements. It's reliable. People know that the fax was received. People know when it was received, unlike email, which certainly has made inroads into fax sales, fax server sales, and fax usage. But major organizations, and I'll show you in the next slide, continue to use fax because it's reliable, because you get notification of receipt, because when someone receives a fax, it's visible, it's there, it's a piece of paper, people act on it, unlike something that's in the mailbox can stay there for uh, quite some time. The latest statistics from the carriers uh, that have submitted reports um, say that more than a billion fax pages are transmitted around the globe annually today. Now I'm going to show you some um, some tests, some, some um, user stories in the next couple of slides to confirm what I'm saying. Most of them you'll find uh, relate to the fact that organisations, particularly in insurance, in finance, in banking, in government, where there's a legal document that needs to be signed and delivered, is still communicated by fax. And fax has, in the courts, like Telex before it, uh, been able to substantiate uh, an agreement between two parties, parties, hence the statement, fax is a legally binding means of communication. The latest Davidson report uh, will give you a measure of um, the IP fax server business. We're obviously not the only organisation uh, doing this but it's $175 million in revenue uh, market sector, uh, which is growing quite rapidly. These statistics um, are provided by Peter Davidson. You'll see down the bottom there, there's a big report out from which I've collected all this information. I'd probably say Peter's probably my friend Peter over here. It's probably got more to do with uh, one number facts uh, for Exchange 2010 rather than Link, because Link can't really do anything with... Uh, with facts. So I promised you I was going to show you um, some organizations that um, have a strong business need to communicate by facts. Uh, Commonwealth Bank uh, has recently um, implemented a, uh, a large upgrade of their fax communications with Message Manager uh, and for all documents that go out that need to be signed and returned to the bank with your signature on them, uh, they communicate that by fax. Uh, HSBC is probably the biggest user of fax I've ever met in my time uh, in this industry. Processes approximately 750,000 multi-page fax messages per month. Uh, they have a uh, system there that um, utilizing barcodes and OCR technology um, that automatically routes incoming faxes to the uh, appropriate person, um, enabling them to quickly authorize some financial transaction and um, send it back out again to, to uh, whoever the uh, 
customer is. There are 87 different um, applications that the solution integrates with at uh, HSBC. For those of you who uh, watch um, the television, uh, free to wear TV, you'll see some ads from Credit Union Australia, Australia's largest boutique bank. Um, they used to have a number of fax servers located in each capital city to process the incoming faxes that were received from their customers. Customers were required to sign forms who were applying for loans, enclose a driver's license, and send it to the bank. Uh, this now runs all on a Cisco network. Um, customers send faxes to a local phone number in Adelaide, in Perth, in Melbourne, etc. Uh, the Cisco router answers the call and delivers the fax over our IP to their head office in Brisbane. Um, you'll see other organisations throughout the world. Um, who are still large users of fax. Uh, Sonic Healthcare, any of you go to Henry Davis Moyer and you pop in, the doctor says, um, did you get that blood test you had last week? And um, you say, yes. Did you get the results? The doctor can ring up Sonic Healthcare and message manager will fax the report to him whilst he's on the phone. Um, Bendigo Bank has recently gone IP. Uh, they send um, loan information um, to uh, and supporting documentation, much like CUA. Um, Blue Scope Steel banks purchase orders to their suppliers. Um, Centrelink, very big user on Cisco network uh, for all those uh, uh, people who are filling in forms, paperwork for benefits. Um, this system is about to integrate with um, the COFAX system so, so they can be recognized. Uh, much like uh, HSBC and automatically routed uh, to the appropriate party. I'm sure many of you have actually picked up the telephone and heard those funny noises over the line and pretty much have said to yourself, oh, it was a fax or something like that. Whilst fax is a very mature and secure um, communication process using uh, HDLC um, frames, uh, an old IBM type communication uh, standard, and the originating fax machine, when it wants to make the call, um, asks the other fax machine that it's sending to it its capabilities, and the receiving fax machine signals those capabilities back to the originator. The originator then sends the first page, and when the page is complete, sends a notification called an EOP, end of page to the other party, the other party says, I got it. It now sends another page, again sends uh, the OP, I've got it. And at the end of the message, they send an EOM. And there's a lot of other uh, communication niceties that go into making a fax communication reliable. It's a quite sophisticated system. The majority of the information that makes it secure, makes it reliable, is communicated using audio. They're the sounds that you hear on that telephone. They're the tones that are communicated uh, from the originator over the PSTN, which is what FAX was designed for. It was designed, as I said, 100 odd years ago before PSTN was around. But really, the Group 3 standard today was designed for fixed wire and A signals to B and B signals back to A using audio. Now, most of the, I'm sure, of those of you attending this web seminar today um, have attended because you've moved to IP telephony. It's rapidly becoming the default, the, the, the standard out there for telephony. And you've plugged in an ATA and you've plugged your fax machine in and it's not been reliable. And that's pretty much been the case for quite a few years. Now, the reason for that is that on IP communications, the, we substitute real audio, as I would call it, for a codec, such as the G711 codec, which does the best job it can do to, to provide the same information that was provided real-time over the PSTN on the IP network. Now, they're designed for voice. They're open by allowing voice. We can say, beg your pardon, I didn't hear. I say, 
more often than that, I must be getting deaf. Um, and um, we probably have a greater understanding of what people were saying, so we we, we, we have a greater reach in our um, in our hearing. But that's not true of facts. If it's not accurate, the fax machine at the distant end doesn't know that that's the end of the page and it's sitting around waiting. It doesn't know about the capabilities of the originating machine. It doesn't know when the end of message is coming. And so what happens is you get multiple retries. You get things such as the second uh, graphic uh, that we have here. I might just um, use the pencil to show it. Uh, this here is an actual fax sent over the IP network using IP communicate uh, using um, uh, an ATA plugged into a fax machine. And you can see it's hardly legible. Now, if you go to a number of engineers, IP engineers, they'll say fax does work on IP networks. I've sent the file. And you can see that the file was received. And sometimes that does happen after multiple retries. But in most cases, that fax is illegible. can't read it because the scan lines have been interrupted and you end up with text that you just can't read. In IP networks, we have packet loss. And that packet loss, as you'll see in this next slide, is the major problem that we have in, um, in, in IP networks. There's two types of um, fax. It's perhaps not the most appropriate place to show you this diagram, but I, uh, this, this slide, but I wanted to show it to you because it actually came from a report uh, manufactured by, I think, uh, written by Brook Trout originally and contributed to by a number of other vendors. We all come to the same conclusion. Fax pass-through, which is essentially sending fax as audio, uh, using the audio tones, over an IP network, is very sensitive to packet loss. So if there's packet loss in the network, it doesn't matter what you do, as Pete and I recently found when a customer wanted to do fax pass through and slow down the network, it didn't make any significant difference. If there's packet loss in the network, you're going to have problems with the reliability of fax. And you can see the statement here, lab testing shows that as little as 0.02% packet loss can cause Max pass through calls to start to fail. Um, there's no redundancy on um, on pass through, but T38, which essentially reduces the audio that I was talking about before to data, as I'll show you in the next diagram, uh, it does have redundancy. It does have a redundancy mechanism uh, if there is packet loss and can sustain substantially more packet loss than uh, pass through. Now, certainly, um, delay can cause some issues in IP networks. Jitter can uh, as well. Uh, but the other one that really is the big problem that we've tended to find these days is what's called clock screw. Clock, it's not screw. I thought I might make a mistake saying that, but clock skew. Um, it's a bit like the old ISDN way of doing things when you have a clock at the originator and the receiver. And if the clocks are not exactly synchronized, you end up with um, differences between the clocks and you then get issues where the fax is just, I guess, unreliable. Is that correct? Yeah, you get buffer overruns or underruns. Okay. Thank you. Is that all you get? So T38, what is T38? Well, you can see down here that it's got certification. The International Telecommunications Union one of the bodies that we rely on for putting rubber stamps or uh, non-rubber stamps uh, on standards has said it's the way to do it. It's the standard for reliably transporting faxes on IP networks. And as I've said, uh, the audio information that's critical in a fax communication process, as I'll again show you in the next slide, is passed over the IP portion of the network using T38 relay protocol, which is its full name. Essentially, the SP on a gateway. Now, for those of you who are not necessarily um, familiar with uh, IP communications, uh, let's take a look at what I'm talking about here. When you go into IP communications, suddenly you get a new piece of equipment, which is called a gateway. Um, this gateway is used to provide the communication from your voice over IP telephony system 
to the people on the public switch telephone network you want to have communication with. It's essentially there for voice communications. 90% of the market, um, 90% of the market, now 90% of the man manufacturers of these gateways include T38 PAC software inside the gateway. I say 90%, I'm sure someone's going to ask me who doesn't, um, and to date, Old vendors of the machines, such as Ericsson MD110, uh, I'm looking at Peter to see if he can remember any other ones. NEC certainly doesn't, uh, in everything bar, I think the SV7000, 8000, but their old machines don't uh, um, support T38, and uh, some of their newer IP machines, because they have a proprietary IP protocol called Proton, don't support T38 in the gateway. But I'll show you an upcoming slide, 90% of the vendors have T38 PAC software in here. And essentially, that is the default way of sending faxes over IP networks, and it's the certified way to do it. Some vendors only support T38. Um, I believe, from my conversations with Alcatel, uh, if they're configured to work in a, an IP environment, they only support T38. Um, some vendors will allow you to set them up to support G711, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. So in this slide, and I might just move to the next one, uh, which shows a little bit better, how T38 fax relay works in, a, in an IP environment with Message Manager. Here is our Message Manager fax server. And here we have it connected to uh, the email server, to all the applications that you may have, the user on his desktop, uh, or to multifunction devices. They all communicate over the LAN various ways um, to message manager packs. A lot of this connection here really hasn't changed over the years to any substantial extent, um, except to when uh, Microsoft uh, changed the interface to Exchange or um, SAP may eventually change the uh, integration from um, RPC to um, SMTP. Uh, but essentially, this is just a modification. These, these type of connections have been there uh, since time in memoriam. But here, Message Manager is actually on the IP network. And when we use T38 Fax Relay, which is the full name for it, essentially we're sending data over that IP network to the gateway, uh, or if it, there is a CPU, such as uh, Cisco Unified Call Manager, a telephone system, um, it's making the decision which gateway for us to communicate with. So on this side of the gateway, we've got Ethernet here, and we have SIP or H.323 call control with the Message Manager Fax Service software. On this side of the gateway, we have a connection to the PSTN. Uh, that connection to the PSTN can be analog or PRI or BRI. And this is the most reliable way of sending faxes over IP networks. We have installed, I don't know how many systems, uh, but we've never had uh, a support call or a problem um, when they've been installed according to this configuration. Am I correct, Mr. Foden, while I have a cup of tea? Sure. Yeah. Now, in recent times, we've had SIP trunks. Uh, in the previous um, presentation, um, I think this gateway um, essentially um, had a PRI on this side of it. But what now we've got in this this diagram is Message Manager talking possibly to a gateway here. So on this side of the environment, we have the customer premises. And on this side of the environment, we have a service provider providing the network. So this is where the T38 fax relay occurs. In this environment, um, you can also get uh, reliable fax communication. This gateway here, um, which is the same gateway that we showed in the previous slide, is essentially providing 
IP communications to the service provider's network, such as Telstra and Optus's network. And it's this gateway which is providing the interface to the PSTN. And this gateway here um, must be able to support T38 or this whole environment won't work. So again, this is the second environment where you can have reliable communications with T38. Previous diagram showed you T38 and a PRI effectively. In this one, you can also do T38 and SIP trunks. But the prerequisite is that the gateway that you're communicating to, that's the last guy in the link before you go to the PSTN, and everybody before it, I would assume too, can support T38. How am I doing so far? Good. Didn't need you, didn't we? Now, but there are some problems with SIP trunks if there's no T38 gateway in the, tele in the service provider's network. Um, this has been recognised as a problem um, by the um, by the fax task group in, that's um, responsible for fax uh, on the ITU, and there is currently a lot of consultation going on uh, about it. Um, as you can see, um, they have an intent that all all carriers, uh, service providers, as I prefer to call, call them, uh, will support T38. Um, by next year. But at the moment, we actually have got a problem. And that problem is very, very relevant to this audience in Australia because Telstra and Optus do not currently support T38 in their network. Telstra may say they do, um, but since Christmas last year, um, when they upgraded to the latest version of firmware and their routers and gateways, uh, T38 fax broke and we had a number of customers already working with, with um, Telstra's IP telephony uh, commonly known as TIPID either in the hosted model uh, or in the um, SIP enabled model. Uh, message manager uh, had been certified for those solutions and by Telstra but unfortunately uh, when they did the upgrade it was only when we heard from a number of customers uh, who suddenly couldn't send their messages who called us up that we discovered the upgrade in Telstra broke their T38 gate. And the only solution currently available is to go back to G711 pass-through. Now, on average, G711 pass-through is probably about 90% as reliable as, uh, as T38. I don't really know how true that is, um, except I've read it, and I've reported it, I think, in this presentation or in a white paper. But let's just talk a little bit about how G711 works. Essentially, uh, it's treated as a voice call over that IP network. They're transmitted as audio, and as I say here, any distortion or disruption of the tones during transit across the network can negatively impact the quality of the transmission. So whilst to all intents and purposes, it looks a bit like the same diagram that we had for T38, but this communication here over the network is not data, it's still audio. Now, as this was the only solution that we had available to the Australian customers whilst uh, Telstra tried to resolve the T38 problem. We did some testing with G711 on what we'll call a managed network. I don't know if there are any service levels actually published on what's called a managed network, but ostensibly a managed network is not the open internet and is a network really designed to minimise or eliminate packet loss. Am I right, Peter? Uh, yeah. So sometimes it's point to point, so it's dedicated to voice or fax. Okay. So when we got um, when we did these tests, we were quite surprised to find that we had a reliable service, uh, a, rel a service so reliable that now Telstra have certified um, connection um, to Message Manager over a SIP trunk 
using G711 pass-through. What that means is that, that those customers who don't have any T38 gateways, um, those service providers that don't have any T38 support inside this gateway, which is currently the position with Telstra and Optus, that we can provide support using G711 pass-through. I hesitate to say that it's as reliable as T38, but and there may be some retries, um, but to date we have three or four customers uh, running this G711 pass-through in both Optus network and in the Telstra network, and we have had no problems to date. And I think that's because it's quite a well-managed network. And so Message Manager Solutions is able to offer this solution to those of you who are contemplating going to a SIP trunk environment where the carrier or the service provider cannot support D38 in his gateway. Subject to one, well, I mean, subject to one condition, and that is, we run our interoperability testing on that network, which we did for both Telstra and for Optus, and have been successful. Now, there are other networks throughout the world that don't support T38, and um, for those, uh, if any of you attending uh, have a concern that um, utilises the SIP trunk, and you're not sure about the carrier. Um, don't hesitate to um, contact us and we'll be able to provide you with the support. But if T38 was reliable, Message Manager Solutions would never provide support for G711. So summarising um, T38 versus G711, T38 is the default. It's a standard space net, uh, integration for fax over IP. G711 is what you do uh, when you don't have it available. You can see why it's a lot more efficient. 25 kilobits per call versus 83. There's redundancy uh, uh, automatically on T38, full, um, full back on T38, uh, secure. I don't think anybody really uses SRTP, do they, Pete? Uh, but you can get it on G711. Have we ever had a request for that? Uh, no. Okay. And uh, high-speed back support. Um, which is um, V34, uh, which is 33.6. Um, you can get it on both environments now. But let me stress that if you wanted to do, have reliable fax over IP, the better way to do it is with uh, T38. If the carrier service provider can't support T38, we can make G711 available, provided um, you're not running out of tell, I guess is what we would say today. One of the major advantages um, with um, IP is that now we get rid of fax boards. Many of you will have used a fax board in your fax server, and uh, you've used that fax board to communicate to the public switch telephone network in that office. We used to call them enterprise fax servers. They really weren't enterprise fax servers. They were an enterprise fax server for everybody living in New South Wales. But if you lived in Perth, you either had to have another fax server to plug into the Western Australian uh, 08 part of the network, or you'd have to have a Sydney fax number, uh, a non-local fax number for everybody in your Perth office. And that's, that's because that's the way the technology worked then. But today, because the gateways, the Cisco routers, the Avaya gateways, the Mitel gateways, etc., are located strategically around the country to where you communicate, it's the telephone number on that gateway uh, that provides the the, um, the, the tele it provides the address for sending and receiving faxes. But back to what I was really talking about, I'll come back to that point in a moment. Many of you have said, well, now that it's software, or even those of you who've got uh, fax boards, how can I run in a virtual environment? Well, you can't with a fax board. But you can run when you have fax software, uh, message manager fax software, 
in your fax server. Um, if you're running the new Cisco SRE or Computing System Express, VMware, Hyper-V and Citrix Zen, I'm going to um, get Pete to talk a little bit about this now because he's done most of the installs. Peter, is um, running fax on a virtual machine reliable? Um, yeah, um, if not more so because you can leverage the high availability and failover that these um, virtual hosting platforms provide. Yeah. And um, how how difficult is it to run Message Manager uh, on um, on a virtual environment? Where have you installed it? Uh, so we so Laminex was one of our early sites that uh, utilised high availability. Um, uh, so you so for example with VMware, um, you have this notion of vMotion, which is where a, a running server can be moved between physical hosts. And um, it, it moves so fast that the uh, the fax will actually continue sending while the host is moved physically from one machine to another. Um, in the event that maybe you know one of the power supplies. So Osama bin Laden decided to. Uh, well, he can't now, can he? But if someone decided to attack uh, the Laminex, for example, data center in Melbourne, um, what do they do about VR? Uh, so in that instance, they would have a uh, a complete image of their running fax server, and they would basically just restore that to their to DR site, um, and then they would just continue. So, so you, you the, yeah, the restoration time is you know minutes. So high availability and um, full tolerance, we really see them as backup today, don't we? So we there's no need for an additional message manager license or cost associated with it because that's part of the operating environment. It's like a an instantaneous backup. Correct. So the second, the second server in that instance, because it's a, it's actually a copy of the first server. That's right. It's using the same license. There's no extra DR license. So, but we've never, we just to, to clear all this up. And what I've got up there on, in this slide here is, one of the questions we do get a lot of is, well, how do you configure this about CPU utilization? Uh, is there any problems with running uh, T38 on um, virtual environments? Uh, with modern CPUs, no. So relative to other processing tasks, um, sending fax is relatively a, a low CPU intensive. Okay. And what about G711 though? Uh, G711 does use more resources, um, but obviously uh, the machine can still be sized accordingly. Okay. Has there been, I think these statistics do show slight differences. Um, yeah, I noticed the Hyper-V uses less uh, CPU than a VMware. So. Okay. And um, you've installed on Hyper-V? Yep. And what about Citrix then? Yeah, we've got customers using Citrix as well. Okay. So really the only issue may be um, you might run out of resources if you were going with G711. I think this said something like you wouldn't want to run more than um, 60 ports or something like that. I think I read recently yeah. of G711. Uh, I think that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So reliability becomes, well, virtual, first of all, virtualization is a reality. Uh, um, uh, reliable operation is, is just as reliable, or as Pete says, more reliable uh, on a virtual environment, certainly with T38. Um, I think the tests that you can see here uh, that we've done recently on the three virtual environments that we're familiar with, I think you can run up to 240 channels per physical machine uh, without a problem in T38, but something like only 60 on G711. And that's just really because we're we're a bit concerned that if you ran any more with all the um, issues that we may find on the network, may utilise a lot more CPU than certainly T38. Yes, yeah, but then you also have um, other um, requirements in terms of converting documents and it's more than just transmitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. So virtualization is reality, and more reliable is what we got from. Mr. Mr. 
workload. At uh, Message Manager, uh, we've um, taken interoperability very seriously. Um, previous versions of um, fax service, including ours and our competitors, really didn't have anything to do with the um, telephone network. But we integrate with the telephone network now, and if you like, um, probably because there are so many parties now involved in putting these things together, um, there are more dependencies. You have to depend on a Microsoft application or SAP application, and now you also have to uh, depend on the, um, the IP telephony people um, and the inter integration with the IP telephony. Message Manager takes this position very seriously. The last thing we want to do to our customers and say to you, well, you've got a problem, but we don't have an Avaya gateway. You have. We can't reproduce it. Uh, we have to go back to our head office overseas, which we don't because we're the head office, and uh, see if they can get on an Avaya network and see what the problem is. You will not allow that to happen. You don't want to have a system that is down for three or four days, while or maybe even longer while someone tries to troubleshoot your problem. Um, so, Message Manager Solutions has certified interoperability and agreements with vendors um, in Cisco and Avaya, for example, which we found to be the most popular. The Cisco TAC is next door. Uh, at Centrelink, we found a problem, a bug in Cisco using an analog interface to the PSTN, which uh, we uh, developed some software to fix for them. Um, we couldn't have done this without this type of relationship. So it doesn't matter whether you've got a, a, a Mitel, a Shortel, uh, an Alcatel, or a Cisco or a Bayer. We've done the interoperability. We tested it. Uh, we know how to resolve the problems. We know what we, we have arrangements in place to reproduce any problems. And this ensures that you do have reliable fax communications over IP networks. In Message Manager, we have uh, integrated with all applications out there, that uh, certainly all popular ones. Um, some of them are uh, shown on the um, slide. Um, and even if we're not showing it on the slide, I'm sure that um, if we haven't already and we've just not publicized the, uh, the name of the brand, uh, we can integrate with it via um, our various APIs, our Applications Connector, uh, XML.net, Web Service, um, whatever. So I started to touch on this point a little earlier, how cost effective a fax server was. Because now when you put it on an IP network, it becomes much more reliable than the state-based systems that I was referring to before, where you had to have a board plugged into the PSTN. You now have multiple interfaces to the PSTN. For those organizations, uh, such as Big W, which has gone across to um, IP now uh, from an old board-based system we had, uh, they are now able to select any router um, on their network enabled by Core Manager, the, the um, SIP proxy and Core Manager, to find the best router, the best route, the most cost-effective route uh, to the fax destination. And if any router happens to go down, then there's a lot of other routers available that we can use. And um, Message Manager has its own way of uh, checking that routers are up and running all the time, and the proxy, or effectively the proxy in Message Manager, can then automatically say, this router's dead, you can't use it, and find a better route uh, by essentially pinging the, uh, the router and providing a better path out there to the, uh, the ultimate fax destination. And you get... Two other advantages with this as well, you only need one fax server. As I was alluding to earlier, you would have, if you wanted to cover Australia and you wanted to give everyone a local fax number, you would have had to have had a fax server in each state of Australia and every country in the world if you wanted. We're a global organisation. I think, and that finds all the fax communications are divided by the 50 other fax servers. So they can reduce the number of fax servers, the associated cost with that. Uh, they, they, can get, they got rid of a lot of analog telephone lines uh, by plugging in their, their um, multi-function devices uh, to the fax server and sending the, the, um, the paper-based fax off the multi-function device 
via the IP network. And there they also got a saving by using the IP network to deliver the fax to the closest destination. Previously, with a Sydney-based fax server, if you wanted to send to an 08 destination, you could pop into the PSDN in Sydney. But now, because you potentially could have an Australia-wide gateway uh, with a, uh, an Australia-wide IP telephony system uh, with a gateway in Perth, you can use the IP system to deliver the fax straight to the fax router, to the IP router in Perth, and then pop into the PSTN. So some organisations, again, such as Laminex, I think you mentioned them earlier, Pete, um, they used to, when they opened up a, a New Zealand operation, they just put a gateway into Perth and a router into Perth, and into, sorry, into New Zealand, and all faxes going to New Zealand went over the, uh, what's the ocean called, the Tasman, um, to buy IP and essentially um, save them the cost of uh, international calls, uh, which previously would have had to go out from Sydney um, and over the PSTN to Auckland. So considerable savings, um, in addition to the reliability ensue from um, using an IP fax server. That brings to an end uh, the presentation today.